questions for, uh, I can see uh, some people have joined and we're just going to wait a few more minutes to uh, let a few more people filter in and, and then we'll get started. Okay, looks like people are, are joining. I think we go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm a bookseller, Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. We're very excited to bring you tonight's event with Emily Maloney for her wonderful book, Cost of Living. Uh, she will be joined in conversation tonight with author Leslie Jameson. And uh, just a couple of brief housekeeping points before we get started. Uh, at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat column uh, to purchase Cost of Living on the Politics and Prose website. Additionally, you can ask the author a question by clicking on the Q&A button. Uh, that can be found uh, down near the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do have closed captioning available. Uh, those can be found by clicking the CC button. Uh, and that's also uh, down at the bottom of your screen right next to the Q&A button. Um, so tonight we welcome Emily Maloney to PMP Live to celebrate the release of her book, Cost of Living, a shocking, often slightly humorous, and brilliant examination of just what exactly our troubled healthcare system asks us to pay, as well as a look at what goes on behind the scenes at our hospitals and in the minds of caregivers. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly said, Maloney artfully unpacks the fraught connection between money and health in her brilliant debut collection. Uh, while USA Today described cost of living as bracingly real, whether Maloney's subject is herself or the medical field, she knows both as patient and professional. Uh, the book is sure to haunt your imagination the next time you enter the labyrinthine healthcare system and face the expenses, financial and otherwise. Emily's work has appeared in Glamour, Virginia Quarterly Review, Best American Essays, and the American Journal of Nursing, and she has twice been awarded a McDowell Fellowship. Tonight's moderator is Leslie Jameson, the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Recovering and the Empathy Exams, and the novel, The Gin Closet. Her recent collection of essays, Make It Scream, Make It Burn, uh, was a finalist for the Penn Award for the Art of the Essay. Leslie is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, and directs the graduate nonfiction program at Columbia University. Emily and Leslie, welcome to PNP Live. The screen is yours. Thanks, Matt. Hi, Emily. Hi. It's such a thrill to be um, to be talking about this book tonight. I was uh, tweeting earlier today about remembering reading the title essay cost of living um, in Virginia Quarterly Review years ago and just feeling that kind of electric charge of I'm in the presence of a voice that I want to keep listening to for the long haul like that that essay blew me away and it continues to blow me away and it brought me great joy to watch and I want to hear more tonight about what the process was but it brought me such joy to, to learn that it was becoming a book, to read the book that it became, it's just tremendous. And I know it's also now become a cake, um, which is also tremendous. Um, so congratulations, but I'm so excited to be talking to you about it tonight. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, do we get to hear a little bit of it, maybe to kick things off? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to just read a few minutes from it. Um, I haven't read from the beginning of the book, um, which does include the title essay. Um, I'm going to start with a note on this book. <clears throat> I don't remember 2005, but I have the medical records. When I set out to write this book, I imagined neat little blocks of prose perfectly arranged. I could simply tell you what happened, how I survived, what I did, I thought of this book as a guide for people who had it happen to them, that everyone seems to have medical debt or know someone who does, and that there would be a clean, orderly way to resolve the issues that came up. I was misdiagnosed, I would explain. It's so easy now. 
The truth is I kept talking to women whose experiences mirrored mine, who had been diagnosed with some injury or illness. And that illness turned, tended not to be a medical failure, but a failure of personality. Feelings were our fault and we felt them too much. I wanted so badly to be slotted into some easy category, some boxes to check, some medication to take. We had entered the biological revolution in psychiatry, my doctor had explained, and could take medication the way diabetics counted insulin. That there was a one-to-one -one relationship between medical diagnosis and medication administration. But this wasn't true. I believed that doctors knew everything, that I could fix myself, my life, with the right doctor or the right medication or more money. That the medical world, that science itself, was black and white, yes or no, hypothesis proven or disproven. I had always put my trust in science. I believed that the dollar answered to the doctor. I thought if only, if I could just do this work, maybe I could pay my debt. Let's read a little bit from cost of living. In 2008, the hospital where I worked, a level two trauma center just outside Chicago, was $54 million in debt. Everyone seemed to be aware of this fact. The figure floated beneath the surface of all our conversations, an unspoken rigidity we seemed to bump up against everywhere we turned. We were to be careful when we distributed small stuffed animals to unhappy children in the ER, were told to dispense fewer scrub tops to adolescents with dislocated shoulders and bloodied shirts, to pay attention to the way that canes seem to walk off as if under their own power. Everything cost money, Helene, our nursing manager reminded us, even if the kid was screaming and had to get staples in his skull. I was an ER tech then, someone who drew blood, performed EKGs and set up suture trays. Most of my knowledge of the world of the ER came through direct patient care. If a nurse or a doctor needed something for a patient, I'd get it for them. I'd run into the stock room, sort through yards of plastic tubing, through dozens of disposable plastic pieces, acres of gauze. We, the techs, were expected to guard against the depletion of resources. Helene seemed to remind us at every available opportunity by take, tacking notes up on the bulletin board in the staff break room. Please conserve your resources. Only use what is necessary. These notes were pinned to our, next to our Prescani survey results, a form sent to patients upon discharge. Helene blacked out staff names if the feedback wasn't positive. But the question of resources seemed like the kind of problem that couldn't be solved through gauze or surveys or suture trays. When it was quiet, a forbidden word in the emergency department, I'd help with the billing. We'd break down charts as fast as possible, scan them, assign codes, and decide what to charge. Names I vaguely recognized flew by on the PDF reader. I studied my handwriting on their medication lists, a form techs weren't supposed to fill out, but did anyway. Nurses were supposed to keep up with the medication lists, but there was never enough time for them to actually do it. Because there were only 20 slots on these forms, I sometimes had to use two pages. I was 23 at the time, still paying off the cost of my mental health care debt I took on at 19, a cost I believed I would shoulder well into my 30s, a figure that felt more like a student loan than an appropriate cost for medical care. I didn't understand the nature of my mistake at the time, that I should have gone somewhere else for treatment, maybe the university hospital, where the state might pick up your bill if you were declared indigent or, no or nowhere at all. Sitting on a cot in the emergency room, I filled out paperwork certifying myself as the responsible party for my own medical care, signed it without looking, anchoring myself to this debt, a stone dropped in the middle of a stream. This debt was the cost of living, and I accumulated it in the telemetry unit, fifth floor, at a community hospital in Iowa City, hundreds of miles from home. I'll stop there. Thank you. It's really powerful to hear it. I've never heard that essay, which I love in your voice. So um, thank you. And I knew that uh, Mercy Hospital sign as well. Um, um, well, and my first 
question is actually um, really rises out of what you just wrote. So one of the things that I love about that essay and about the collection as a whole is the way that you write about uh, receiving care and giving care and you know concretely that means writing about all these dimensions of your life as a patient in different eras but also dimensions of your life as a you know a caregiver um an er tech um uh and sort of encountering both encountering debt from both of those patient and caregiver angles but also um encountering the body encountering various forms of trauma, encountering various kinds of chronic conditions. The chronic is something else I'd be curious to talk to you about. But my first question is, um, and I don't think I've ever asked this question of anyone before, but your book seems like the perfect book to occasion it. How would you describe the differences between writing about receiving care and giving it? Like, are there different sort of emotional and craft challenges that attend to writing about receiving care and writing about giving care? That's a really good question. Um, I think that a lot of the pieces of this book, um, especially when I was working in the ER and then later um, when I, you know, was a, there's, there's another part of the book that of course takes place um, in where I'm sort of shadowing um, in a, as a student. Um, and, and those sections I wrote in the moment. Um, a lot of the, the sections that take place in the ER were things that I wrote, you know, when I got home from my job. Um, and so a lot of those sections actually date to 2008 or 2009 or, 2000, you know, 2010, somewhere in there. Um, a lot of the, the essays where I talk about and I think I guess I go back and forth between uh, both my own lived experience and the experience of other people and caring for other people. Um, a lot of those pieces sort of came later, right? Because I, I didn't really understand how to write an essay until about 2014. Um, I took a summer class uh, with Philip Lopate and he explained my problems of which there were many. Um, but, but I really, explain my problems to me as well. So that's good. That's good. See, it's, it's always important to have someone explain your essay problems to you. Um, but that, that experience, I think sort of let me understand, oh, like I don't need to, you know, it's that whole to show and to tell thing. Like, I don't need to just talk about my, um, you know, I don't need to just make scenes. I also have to have an opinion about what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and that for me came a lot later, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up having to sort of go back. A lot of my process involves um, printing out dozens and dozens of pages and then taking a pair of scissors and cutting things up and putting it all on the table or on the floor. And then the dog comes in and the pages go everywhere. Um, <laughs> so so that's, that's, that's a lot of, of that process um, of, of sort of figuring out where the, where my voice as a patient works and also where um, my voice, uh, talking about other people, um, in these other settings. One of the things I was curious about that I'll ask you about in a little bit was actually your revision process. So it's good to know going into that question that a dog, an agent of chaos, an agent is, of chaos. A is a force in that process. Maybe we all need a sort of disruptive external agent in our in our revision process because part of the trick right is like getting outside of whatever the grooves are of how you thought it and essay needed to be arranged or what you thought went where that's true that's true uh, helps you out of your grooves um but I was also I mean it's interesting to me that some of those especially some of those um some of the writing about working in the ER happened and was drawing on at least notes taken right then because there is this moment that I wanted to ask you about I know it, it maybe is awkward, but I'm just gonna read like two sentences of your own writing to you. But um, I loved this passage on a um, uh, little bit later in the book um, where you're, you're having some identification with a patient who's come into the ER um, and 
you said, I had sleep disturbances, failed to make appropriate friendships, lived in a well of loneliness of my own making, routinely fantasized about killing myself, and perhaps strangest of all, had a woman in my head who narrated everything as it happened, someone whose apparent role it was to be a kind of judgy commentator, a lens through which I saw the world. She was certainly not me, but helped me practice what to say before saying it. In any event, I had little control over what she said. Later, I realized she was telling me what to write down. Um, and I wanted to ask you about um, the woman who narrated everything in your head and both how you might connect her presence to the experience of living in the world for you in, in, in both that sense of like how you make, make sense of things as they're happening to you, how you feel both kind of inside of living and maybe like you're observing it from the outside and then you know who is that woman who narrates everything inside your head what's her relationship to your writing practice and sort of how you know what 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 role does she play in taking lived experience and turning it into these essays I have no control over <laughs> her <laughs> she wakes me up in the middle of the night to work um <laughs> you know she'll just be like okay and then we're off. Um, I don't, I think that, that that process took me a, a really long time. I, I have nonverbal learning disability, which is a developmental disability similar to autism in some respects. And so um, there's this part of me that's sort of wired for sound um, at very slow processing speed. So it'll take me like 10 minutes to get jokes. But the experience of that uh, being sort of primed for sound and um, primed for verbal uh, information um, means that I can use her to sort of navigate a lot of social situations. So it offers like an, an opportunity for me to practice. Um, and that makes things a lot easier. But, but then, you know, I, I realized that in writing down a lot of these things, there was something, you know, interesting there, maybe, I don't know. And that, that sort of became um, a way for me to make work. Um, I'm, you know, when I, when I think about, I don't know, I know that like, I don't wanna be precious or weird about it. It's just, you know, I, I just write down whatever she says, um, but it takes me a long time to, to get to that point. So like, I, I, I read the book in my head, I flip the pages in my head, I can read, certain pages and rearrange things and then at some point later then she starts talking and then I'm like okay you know probably I should take notes um but it takes a while for me to get there I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> yeah no it's it, it it starts to and and I think the the um yeah that that experience certainly of feeling I mean it's interesting to hear that there's both a way that there's a form of agency that comes through her maybe around like practicing or working on things, but also a way in which you are, you know, responding to <laughs> her call in the middle of the night or, um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, process wise, I'm also curious. I mean, I both would really love to hear how this book came to be in terms of like how you came to write the title essay, if it was the beginning of the book, I mean, maybe you had been, it sounds like you've been at least working on a lot of this material already for years, but um, how the book emerged, you know, through that title essay and, and, and also why, I mean, I share a great love for the essay, um, but I'm curious to hear for you, like what essays allowed you to do in this book? Like one could imagine a very different version of this book that maybe looked more like chronological, memoir right because sure. you know, we're sure. it was that at one point yeah well talk, um, talk to me about yeah talk to me yeah, about yeah. evolution and what essays let you do that maybe that version so, of it didn't let you do for sure I sold this book as an essay collection um largely based on my cost of living piece um and then it became a memoir in revision and then it became an essay collection again um Actually, my editor ended up being really instrumental in sort of helping me put the pieces together because I'm not really good at the big picture stuff. 
Um, I'd rather just play with sentences. <laughs> um, and so that basically what happened with, um, with cost of living, the essay was I was supposed to be on assignment for VQR. Um, I was writing this piece for them and I had a problem with my source um, and the whole piece just kind of fell apart after that. <laughs> and so I, I emailed Paul Reyes at, you know, my editor and I said, Hey, you know, would you take, would you take this essay from my MFA thesis <laughs> instead? <laughs> um, <laughs> and he said, sure, we can do something with this. Um, it had a different title then. I'm really bad at titles. So it was, it was originally called like the cost of suffering or something like that. It was like really dour. Um, but uh, Paul worked with me on it and that was really sort of instrumental initially. And then um, after the book was sold, I really struggled with how to talk about some of the bigger issues that I really wanted to talk about. Um, I had gotten this job working in the pharmaceutical industry, and then I got another job working in the pharmaceutical industry, and I thought, I need to talk about this too. Um, and it wasn't until I was really sort of in the weeds, um, you know, I had, I had this sort of terrible job where I, I was, I managed a team of medical writers who published the results of clinical trials, and so I had to go to these conferences in like Vienna or whatever. And then, you know, it was, it was great, except for the fact that it was, you know, it's Vienna in February. It's like not especially great. Um, <laughs> it's like Pittsburgh, you know, it's like really, really, really cloudy. Um, but I think that, you know, being able to, to sort of wrestle with these big ideas of healthcare inequality, of the ways in which I kept running into people who would say, oh yeah, I had a terrible experience or yes, I have $200,000 in medical debt, but I have a new heart and that's what matters. You know, like just wild stories from people who had had these crazy experiences combined with the fact that I was then at the time working, you know, flying business class to <laughs> all over the world. I, I got some great miles out of it. Um, you know, and I thought, wow, like I'm actually part, I'm, I'm, I'm an agent of, you know, I mean, I, I worked for very ethical companies, you know, I, I feel like I did good work. Everybody I worked with, you know, was, was really smart and they wanted to do what was right for patients. But ultimately I thought, wow, this is really costing a lot of money. Um, and I wanted to be able to include those segments as well. And I think that it wasn't until sort of that point where I realized, oh yes, absolutely. This has to be a 30,000 foot view. I can't, talk about this in a, you know, in a sort of, there's, there's limitations, right, to memoir, you know, you, you end up with the story of something that happened, and that can be really interesting, but I wanted to be able to talk about some of these larger issues. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, um, that's a really great answer. I'm sitting here thinking, like, I wouldn't mind going to Vienna, <laughs> even though it's February. Um, right, I no, it's great, except, you know, <laughs> Um, a different life at the time. A different life. Um, but that idea that kind of the tra traffic moving between experience and ideas, you know, takes different, that, that toggling or that motion takes different forms and different genres. But I think it is one of the gifts of the essay that it allows that, that movement between kind of what happened, a, a, a process of meaning making around what happened and then a process of kind of linking that meaning making around individual life up to these larger questions and you do it so beautifully here um and i i would love to hear a little bit about like the genesis of i mean there are essays about um there are essays that are sort of anchored in particular patients you encountered in the er there are aspect there are essays that are anchored in um dimensions of your own experience as a patient. I'm really curious, I have a couple of questions about um, how you write about your relationship with um, your primary psychiatrist. Um, there's an essay about pain and how pain is treated and how complicated that becomes. But I'm curious, like sort of where did, did essays emerge in all kinds of ways? Did they sometimes emerge with like the experiences and feeling that there's something here and I have to figure out what the questions are here? Did they sometimes emerge from a more abstract idea or question? And you're like, what experiences am I gonna draw on to investigate this question? Like, how did you sort of figure out 
how the sh how there was a, a there there or a kind of heat source there for each of these pieces. Sure, there were a lot of essays that sort of petered out for me, um, pieces that I thought might be essays, and then they just sort of became stubs and lived on my laptop. And there's value in that. I mean, I think, you know, I don't, they might become essays later, you know, they're just still, I don't know, gestating or something like that. I think that also, I don't know, I think the Yes, there were essays that started with, you know, I have a question or I have an idea. Um, but there were also essays where um, I, I actually had this conversation with my editor. My editor would say, Emily, we need to know about X. What's the best way for us to know about X? Um, you know, in case someone wants to read about this, you know, your experiences in some kind of chronology or some kind of narrative, you know, how are we going to communicate this bit of connected tissue or that bit of connected tissue and that that stuff come, came way late in the game um, for me but in terms of like deciding what's an essay and what's not I don't know um I I talk about this all the time when I'm when I'm teaching but um there are uh I, um Ann Fadiman came to our class at Pitt once and told us we were either swamp drivers or diamond polishers. We either had to like uh, polish the right, the put the right word down and then get to the next word and the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, and by that way you could build something. Um, and then there were the people in our class who were swamp drivers who would come, you know, show up to workshop with like 7,000 words they had written that, that morning on whatever, you know, it was, it was kind of, shocking to me. Um, I, I, of course, am kind of a diamond polisher. Um, everyone always wants to be the other is what the other thing she said, but um, that really stuck with me. And I think that uh, that sort of method of building in sentences, the idea that the sentence is the unit of prose and to try and, and build these, these attractive sentences and see where they take you. Um, was really sort of the driving force behind probably most of the essays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm such a swamp driver. God, I was like, and I totally want to be a diamond polisher. Most people are, most people are swamp drivers. Um, I, I want to be a swamp driver, you know, and the diamond polishers, like, it's just, it's, it's a hard way to live. You know, you just, you only have like a certain number of words. Um, you have to learn how to write faster. You know, it's, 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 it's rough. <laughs> I'm picturing you in a, like a glittering in a glittering room of diamonds as I'm like driving my truck around the swamp and my editors <laughs> who are like God, we just turned in this twelve thousand word piece for we can have to turn into three thousand words. I also love, by the way, that you told that story about how this beautiful essay, Cost of Living. Um, came into the world in part because this other essay fell apart because I think that's so real like that is always I mean how many you know how many pieces of writing in my own life have come because I was like trying to avoid the thing I was supposed to be working on or all of those like inglorious truths of how things come together and fall apart and what emerges and I think it's so helpful and useful to be candid about those parts of the process because it can kind of give us all hope that when the one thing isn't coming together, maybe that's making room for another thing to come together or come into sure. the world. So, um, but I was thinking about, um, uh, you know, um, I mean, you've been talking some about how by the nature of what you're writing about this collection involves moving between your story and the stories of other people. And, um, and I have a ton of questions, as you know, but I'm also, I see some starting to pop up in the Q&A. I would encourage people to, if you have questions, go ahead and put them there. I'm going to turn to them and try to make room for all of them. So um, don't be shy. We want to hear them all. Um, but I was thinking about this moment where, um, I think it's on, I marked it here. Um, you said, my whole life I've been trying to disappear, hoping for some trapdoor opportunity. And I, I was curious, um, in light of a kind of lived desire, at least at some points, to disappear, 
what it was like to construct yourself as a character or to make yourself visible as a constructed character in this book? Like, how does that kind of urge toward disappearance interact with the muscles and the emotional complexity of making yourself visible in the ways that one does, not as like, you know, we both write and think about this, I think a lot, but not as like a revelation of like, here are my diaries, but like as a construction of like, here right, are Right, right, yeah. right. There's like the narrator, the author and the character, right? And like, I don't know, there's that, who is it, Riken wrote an essay about like how uh, narrators, uh, characters and authors in first novels tend to be totally flat. And so they, everyone just sort of collapses um, into this singular viewpoint. And that's why so many first novels sort of fail. Um, and I, I think about that in terms of nonfiction uh, all the time. Um, I think that, you know, there is a lot of work, right, in constructing yourself into a character because you are not the person who, you know, exists on the page in the book. Um, you have to do all this work of, of creating this, this, pers this person who, you know, could have been you once maybe um, in some other lifetime or, uh, you know, had some kind of relationship with who you are, of course, but it's not exactly you. Um, and I, I think, um, honestly, I, I took a class with um, Susan Lohafer at Iowa, and she said, that my whole shtick was like the world according to Emily. Um, and despite my best efforts, I've, I've sort of been stuck with that ever since. I think that, that that sort of um, descriptor uh, enables me to both create this persona um, that I'm also actively trying to erase um, <laughs> at the same time, right? I think it's, I think it's a lot of, there's a lot of work. I didn't really want to um, appear on the page. Like a lot of my early essays before I actually learned how to write an essay um, were just scenes, right? I wrote a lot of like fiction where terrible things happen to my characters. Um, and that kind of, that kind of work, it, it taught me how to, how to, you know, paint a picture but it didn't solve the problem of like me being like a hideous monster on the page, which I don't know, as writers, we kind of are always, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I, I just feel like uh, there's so much, there's so much that has to, there's so much work in, in creating that, that, that monster. Um, that persona and and it's it, it takes a long time and I think that you know ultimately um, I think it's hard for people who maybe don't even necessarily read uh, nonfiction or read memoir or read you know they think well you know like what about these other things you know did this happen did that happen you know uh, most of my the criticisms that come of my book uh, so far have been mostly like well, you know, what happens in between these essays. And I think that that's where the reader can, you know, take a break or doodle in the margins or whatever they need to do. But, but I, I do think that, that there is something in that space um, that leaves the reader to sort of decide how they're going to navigate. Um, they, they can make up their own mind and make their own choices about what kind of a relationship they're going to have with the characters on the page. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I've never quite heard it formulated that way, but I I find that formulation really fascinating that the, in, the, in the gaps or some of the unspoken places in the construction of self on the page, there's room for readers to form a relationship or for something to happen. And, and you know, it's certainly true. I think Maggie Nelson, um, once said this quite succinctly and wisely that readers are so aware of everything they know about a narrator like they in that that can give rise to that sense of like I know you so well like I know and the writer is always aware right. of 
the things yeah. that have not been said yet. Right, like, right, right. Oh, right. so no, you know, and so thinking about those gaps, not again, yeah, not as a way in which a deficiency or a way in which the work is compromised, but actually also a space in which or a means by which a relationship is being formed between uh, the writer and the reader, I think is, is really, um, is really interesting. And, you know, and, you know, when you said, when you talked about the monster, I was thinking, I, 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 I really identify with that feeling that it's almost like the skew, you know, people might imagine that there would be an impulse towards self ennobling or something like that. And maybe there is for certain writers, but I, right. my impulse is always much more like, you know, a kind of preemptive self laceration so that people can't, anything that somebody bad could say about me, I've already said about myself or something like that, which is its right. own crazy cobbling problems. But I wonder what for you, what you've noticed, like where do you lean in constructing yourself as a character that you, you then in the process of revision have to kind of course correct for or think like, oh, I've made myself too simple or too skewed in this direction. So I have to kind of complicate myself sure. by adding these layers over here. I think a lot of it was, um, there were a number of iterations of this book that did not have a way of explaining, um, I don't know, there's like a lot of like nuts and bolts stuff that sort of came in later drafts. Like, you know, I am a person, I live here, you know? <laughs> I have a living, breathing body. These kinds of issues were not things that I really thought about. You know, I was just like, you know, wow, like sucks having a body. But like a lot of that um, sort of the notion of, of, of having a body and having to deal with the reality of that body, mm -hmm. those came later. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my early attempts were sort of, I don't know, disembodied heads mm -hmm. or talking head problems. I think I think there's a lot of, um, I don't know. I never thought of myself as like, I'm not an intellectual, you know, I'm just someone who likes to read. And so I just thought, you know, I wanted to read a book that I could find, um, on a shelf that, that represented, you know, some part of what I experienced. Um, and I hadn't really found that exactly. Um, and, and in these later drafts, like a lot of it, you know, my editor would say, well, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> Who are you? Where are you? Um, you know, where are you living? What kind of, you know, what kind of, what does your life look like, you know, when you're not doing these things? And so a lot of those things, um, yeah, sort of came, came at a later date. Um, I think that that, that, that took me a while. Yeah, I mean, and that, you know, um, I'm going to ask two more questions, although there's a vast well there because I see that there are um, already some and, and there are soon to be more. Um, and I, I want to leave plenty of room for what, what everybody here is wondering about. But um, what, you were, it, it, what you were just saying about sort of uh, moving from like disembodied narration to more embodied narration or being like, I, I live in a body and here's some of like what that body is doing, whether that's, you know, there, there's a kind of amazing um, recurring like uh, dimension of your experience in these pages that has to do with like going home and washing dishes, you know, like we see your body washing dishes at like a number of junctures. Um, and I think there's, um, there is something quite fascinating about watching your body move between like the spaces of working in an ER and then going home or um, selling a condo or, you know, like we see your body moving through all these different spheres. But I was struck, there's a moment where you say that part of what you were drawn to about being an ER tech was um, that it brought you close to bodies, that it was mm -hmm. a way of being near bodies. And in a way I think of this as such a, um, such an embodied book because it is so much about caring for bodies um and you know so it's, it's interesting that actually some of that in terms of your own body came came later but uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you before I turn it over is um is yeah what role you feel the body plays in your work like what kinds of like when you got closer to your own bodily experience what sorts of truths emerged from that proximity or from making the writing more embodied? I mean, beyond kind of 
anchoring in space time? Like, did you find that sort of emotional complexities came up in a different way when you got closer to the body in, in your writing? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I think that's partly also the nonverbal learning disability. There's like this, um, I don't know, a lot of us have flatter affect and um, I don't know, my friends in college would tell me that like, like I would invite everybody over for, for dinner or something like that on Thursday nights. And, and like, you know, I would pour an entire bucket of, or an entire pot of hot pasta water. Like I'd like miss the sink, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'd pour it out. Like I'd pour it like down the front of my, my clothes. And, and like, my friend would be like, would say something along the lines of, oh my God, are, are you okay? And I, I would, you know, there's like, there's like a delay. <laughs> there's a delay in, in sort of the, the registration. Oh, shoot. I missed, I missed what I meant to put there. Um, and that I think also plays a role in the way I think about the world and the way that I interact with it is that um, I'm really bad at judging the dimensions of door jams. Um, I, my knees are always bruised. I bang my knee on our bed to the point where like, I think maybe we should just sleep on a mattress on the floor. I don't know anymore. I just, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm naturally clumsy, but in a way that uh, comes from this nonverbal learning disability. Um, and so it can be really challenging to sort of navigate spaces. Um, and there's this disconnect in terms of, you know, well, I think things are looking like this, but in reality, things look very different. Um, that disconnect shows up for me again and again and again. I'm always like, oh, you know, I had no idea. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to like, you know, fit pieces of, a, of something together and they, and they don't. Like they're, they're, they're different scales all together. And, and, you know, my husband will come in and he'll be like, that's not gonna fit in that box. Um, <laughs> and, and that kind of, that kind of experience for me is just like, it's constant. Like I don't uh, register. There's a part of my brain that just doesn't register that information. Um, and so that I think I'm sure shows up in my writing as a result. Um, but that, that is something that I'm always sort of having to contend with. Well, I love, I mean, I think it, it actually shows up quite explicitly in your construction of yourself as a narrator on the page, you know, you write at different points about, you know, not this lived experience of not quite fitting into the world. And, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. And I think does mean a few different things in these pages, but certainly one of the things it means is very concrete and embodied. And like, how do I, how close do I stand to other people? How do I arrange my body in this space? And so I actually think that becomes this to me quite compelling layer to who the narrator is rather than a kind of um, something that has to be overcome in the in the prose or through the prose it's like part of the texture of the prose and part and part of the perspective and at least I felt reading it that there were forms of like acuity and attention that come from that sense of not quite fitting rather than seamlessly fitting and because mm -hmm. in states of seamlessly fitting things can disappear or become transparent I think more easily so um I'm gonna okay I see some questions so I'm gonna um turn to them and others should put them in and and uh, maybe I'll sneak in a few more of my own uh, but there are some great ones already here um Laura Hubbard hi Laura says beautiful book Emily um I love how scene driven this book is. Can you speak to your process of how you navigated stepping back into moments of wide angle perspective reflection that, that complement the scenes? What does that process look like for you? Um, usually I don't provide enough. <laughs> and then someone tells me to provide more. <laughs> I'm not very good at, at that part. Um, I think that there's a it, it's, it's challenging for me. So I, I think that that kind of um, moving uh, back and forth, um, a lot of that happens either in revision um, or then I, you know, I also am, it's the part of me that's cutting up essays and rearranging them. Um, and, and a lot happens, I think, in like the sort of juxtaposition of different sections. Um, or at least that was my aim. Um, and so that's, I think, probably the best way to describe it. I know that it's not 
stepping back into moments of wide angle perspective and reflection. I think that a lot of it is, is, is just, um, you have to trust your reader, right? I think that a lot of, of writers, when, when this doesn't work out, it doesn't work out because the writer has expected too little of the reader. And so they talk down to the reader in those sections. Um, I think that that's really common. And, and, you know, for me, I don't put enough information in those sections and I have to go back and put more. But I feel like that, that problem, either putting not enough information or too much information is, is a really common early draft kind of problem. And I love, and I, I also love sometimes just even at the beginning of that question, how you were like, you know, somebody, an editor or a reader or whatever tells me that I have to put more in because I do, you know, I think um, there's so, there's such like beauty. I mean, sometimes pain or painful recognition in the process of other people seeing in our work, what we can't quite see in it ourselves, but also this kind of, you know, you think you're in a room and then somebody else reads your work and you realize the room is a house because they've been able to see all these doorways going off in other directions or, you know, say, oh, there's more, I think there might be more reflection possible here. And then, oh, yeah. there's like the conservatory or whatever behind the secret passageway. For, um, for me, like, I'm just like, the, the space is dark. I'm just stumbling <laughs> around. I'm trying to identify the furniture. I'm like, you know, is this a table leg? Like, are we in are a kitchen? I have, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my drafting process. <laughs> and hopefully, right. Hopefully there can be a few like bruised knees saved in the in the for first sure, for sure. process. Um, there's another question here about pain. Um, would you please say more about how you examine pain in your book? Perhaps even read an excerpt. Um, but yes, the role of pain here. Yeah. Um, well, my I got to do the audiobook. Um, so there is that, uh, there, a lot of the discussions of pain show up, I think later in the narrative, because, um, that was my own experience. Um, I sort of fell down a kind of, our neighbor's snow blowing outside. I hope, I hope you guys don't hear that. Um, I sort of fell down a, a kind of, um, autoimmune ladder where I ended up initially diagnosed with one thing and then two or three diagnoses later they thought well you know we'll just add this on um and so a lot of my initial interest in uh pain physical pain in particular came from my own lived experience um with pain and then in terms of sort of the pain patients that i talk about um this was a piece that was in vqr last fall the book version is a little different um but pretty similar in some respects and I, I just feel like we live in a world where um, we don't take people's pain seriously, particularly if they're a person of color or a woman. Um, and so that was really important for me to talk about because um, I kept seeing, you know, I'd go on these online forums and I would see, you know, pain, chronic pain patients being tapered off their medication and I would try and connect with them. And then, you know, they would have some kind of problem inevitably that would, you know, that they would face or they would attempt suicide or, you know, there were so many issues that kept coming up and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to write about this. Um, so that's, I think, where that, that came up, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you write about that so beautifully too. In a way, it's almost like a, a kind of complication in the research project, I mean, complication is like a horrible and callous word for it, but this way that people that you're in conversation with keep sort of disappearing, but that actually becomes this really poignant, powerful feature of the piece that like often they're disappearing because something terrible has happened. I mean, that that's, you know, that, that that's the part of the landscape of pain. Right. Um, uh, so many great questions. Um, Eve uh, says, I found the nonverbal learning disability really interesting given the move to write a book. Um, how does this inform how you work and move forward as an author? None of us NLDers have books. Very few, there are very few. There are a few people who write books. Um, English was my worst subject in school. 
I just kept taking writing classes because the classes were really small at Iowa. So I could just continue to take those classes and then I would petition for them to be added to my degree. And I eventually ended up with an English degree. Mm -hmm. um, but math was much easier in a lot of respects because it, there wasn't any of this sort of like nuance. Um, I cannot write a five paragraph essay to save my life. So um, a gift to the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> And in terms of moving forward, as an, um, I'm working on a new book, um, and it's coming together in much the same way that Cost of Living has. Um, or I might ask you um, just a little bit more about that as our last question. Um, uh, I'm glad to hear that's the case, though. Uh, Jessica um, says, hi, Emily. I love your work, but you knew that. Uh, do you see cost of living in conversation with any other contemporary nonfiction book? Did you read anything thematically related or not for inspiration? I tried to stay away at the time I was drafting. Um, there are a lot of really great books that are coming out right now that I'm really excited to read, but I haven't read yet because I've sort of been drowning a little bit. Um, mostly I read fiction. Um, I do read nonfiction too, um, but a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I'm reading right now, um, like I'm obsessed with this book, The School for Good Mothers, Jasmine Chan. Um, I want to have like a there should be like a it's been talked about online, but there should be a book club that's just like terrifying novels about motherhood. I'm really into this right now, um, but I think that a lot of there are a lot of great examples. Um, something that I came back to again and again and again was Joan Wickersham's The Suicide Index. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, Leslie, like it was like you <laughs> with, with, uh, with the empathy exams. And then, um, you know, I also, and then Joan Wickersham, because I feel like she has this sensibility about sentences and a sort of humor in her work that just keeps coming up again and again and again. Um, Paul Sicky. I, I just, there, there's so many authors who I just kept going back to again and again and again to get into the right mode, but not necessarily covering the same topics because I didn't want to end up uh, getting into that too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for it to be sort of a space you wanted to inhabit, but there to be that distance there that also, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, um, yeah, made it feel like you weren't in inheriting too much. Um, uh, Liz says, Emily, you've talked a lot about times your editor would ask you questions or make suggestions that helped you. Uh, do you feel your editor was a partner in your writing process? Yes, um, my editor mostly edits these like really glittery looking commercial books, um, like Mariah Carey's memoir. Um, I'm pretty sure prior to finding this out, I, I don't think I could tell you the difference between Mariah Carey and um, Celine Dion. Like I didn't, I didn't, like I knew one of them was from Canada, but like that was it. Um, so he mostly uh, edits these really big commercial sparkly books. Um, a lot of like Real Housewives, like, you know, just really commercial books. And so I, I really value his, he, he like, I don't know, he lets me go off and do my weird sentences. And then he has big structural questions that help me put things in the right order. Mm -hmm. um, so he was really a very active partner and close, you know, in terms of the way that we work together again and again and again to try and figure out the shape of this manuscript. Um, very patient with me. <laughs> it took me a while. So he's like we got to drive this truck through the whole swamp now so <laughs> and back, back, back and, and forth and back and forth no it's, 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 it's like that a little bit yeah um um uh, athena what a great question here she the starts with the disclaimer is so many great questions too um if you find this question exhausting or uninteresting please skip it but i'm wondering which ways if any the COVID-19 pandemic has made you see either the structural bureaucratic problems or interpersonal qualities of care that you described in your book with new eyes. I think that the pandemic has brought to light the fact that the American healthcare system has been broken for a very long time. And unfortunately, it's probably just going to continue to break as we have seen um, until other choices are made. 
ideally Medicare for all. Um, but I, I, I do feel that, you know, we're, we're in a, in a very tough place right now because this, the, the question of resource allocation, um, nursing shortages, staffing shortages, the fact that we don't have enough doctors, all of these things were problems before the pandemic. Um, and then there's all these other sort of pandemics or epidemics that are happening at the same time, like the, you know, the, the, the notion of the opioid epidemic or, you know, and the discussion around that, um, those people are still suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, those people have, are, you know, have been tapered off their pain pills and are seeking out fentanyl. So, you know, not all of them, but certainly a certain percentage of, of, of you know, of, of, of patients. Um, so I do feel that, you know, a lot of the, the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, has sort of both brought to light and then also add, added another layer of suck and suffering um, for a lot of a lot of people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping the next book is called Another Layer of Suck and Suffering. <laughs> um. It's not. It's not, but I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I need yeah. a third book. <laughs> Yes, a hard cosine on all of what you just said. Um, uh, one, one more last wonderful question that I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit about this next book. Um, Christy says, I love this idea of appearance and disappearance with voices and perspectives. How do you balance the ethics of representing those people and their experiences with your own story and ideas? Good question. Um, I think that I wanted to be very careful in the way that I represented people, um, people who show up in this book, who feel that they could identify themselves who were patients um, or people I worked with. Some of those people are folks that I, you know, did extensive interviewing with long after our time together. Um, I'm, I'm still learning how to, how to do that, how to be smart about that, how to be thoughtful and deliberate, but I, I, I just, I think it's really important to extend compassion to the people that you write about. And also to just understand that the relationship you have with, with those people, it's not, you're not going to be able to, to capture them appropriately. I don't think ever you're doing a, an approximation. And in that approximation, um, the parts that you can't fill in with them, that's where you come in. Um, as a narrator, or as a as a character yourself, um, I think that that's really the only way through. Yeah, and again, like sort of recognizing those gaps not as things that can or should be filled in, but as just part of the nature of the thing. It's so necessary. Um, well, tell us before we close out. Um, first of all, it's been such such a pleasure to get to hear you speak about this book. Um, tell us a little bit about the the next or the, the book in progress? Oh gosh. Uh, um, it is, there's an announcement maybe tomorrow um, <laughs> or maybe Monday. <laughs> I don't know how Publishers Marketplace works, um, but it's about, it, it's, an, it's an exploration um, of mental illness, um, particularly this, this notion of, of psychopathy um, mm -hmm. that uses my own family as a jumping off point to talk about some larger issues and how we sort of um, misrepresent people in popular culture and in other, in other places. It's called Burn This House Down. Um, and it involves an actual fire. <laughs> um, my, my, uh, I, I have to I have to figure out how to do the the like the pitch for it. I should like look up the um, this is already sounding the publisher's great. marketplace uh, <laughs> description of it. But it's um, you know and a few years ago, um, my brother burned my parents' house mm -hmm. out in the country to the ground, um, and I I want to know why I want to know why he did it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand what happened exactly, and I'm looking for this book as an opportunity to um, to sort of further explore this this notion of of mental illness, of diagnosis. Um, he carried a number of different diagnoses 
sort of as he navigated through various systems. Um, and I, I want to understand uh, like how those, how we ended up there. Mm -hmm. um, what, what led us to that point. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the next book um, and I'm working on it and uh, making some progress here and there as I can, but that's, that's the next one. It sounds hard and big and um, valuable. So thank you. And, I hope so. And um, so, so wonderful to be here with you tonight. And congratulations on this tremendous book and all of the wonderful ways that it's been received. Thank you so much. Very much for a, a wonderful conversation tonight. Really, really enjoyed it. And I, I think swamp drivers and uh, diamond polishers will stay with me for a very long time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it seems maybe- <laughs> Maybe Matt's frozen. Matt, 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 Matt is dropping the mic with them, um, with the swamp drivers and diamond polishers. Oh. Dear, can you hear me now? <laughs> there we go. You're back. What a time to freeze. Um, but just mind you that uh, to check out the link in the chat column to purchase your copy of Cost of Living, uh, your patronage helps us bring uh, you great authors like Emily Maloney. And, uh, and it's a um, Thank you all for joining us. I should probably wrap up before I freeze again and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Paul, yeah. and Crows. Thanks, Thanks Paul, and Crows.